Come Tuesday afternoon, I felt like I'd been in a triathlon. Um, so I knew that that meant it was going to be a long week. So I don't know about you, you guys click clickbait stuff, especially BuzzFeed. You know, it's probably going to like brighten your day a little bit. Um, I wanted to look at some humanity fails with you tonight. Um, for just a couple of minutes, we're going to put some stupid people on the screen, and you can maybe like revel in the stupidity of humanity. Um, maybe you're going to feel a little bit lost um, because your human race is so disappointing. Um, and just those give up moments. But you know, they have like the like good things that's restoring faith in humanity, but you're always going to click the, the fail first, right? Okay, so this one, which I was personally offended in, right? My girls, by the way, believe Batman is real, right up there with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Um, they believe that Batman takes the bad guys to my mom's boyfriend, who's a prison guard, so that he can keep the bad guys there. So as far as they're concerned, Bane is in a local prison, okay? So don't break my kids' hearts. Um, but that's, that's sad. This is scary. Medium rare, the only way to eat chicken. Dude. <laughs> then this person, she's just selfish, guys. Do you see the people standing in the back? on this subway, and she's like just laying there, taking up like four seats, reading a book, all camped out. That's just rude. Then this super bright man that's changing and working on his car. I mean, that's real great right there. These geniuses that are at least three stories high, right? This is one of my favorites, guys. Thieves that attempt to siphon gas, but accidentally suck out sewage, okay? This was in Australia, back when gas was like almost four bucks a gallon, and he thought that was a great idea, but he regretted it real quick. Then, did you guys hear about this super tall snowman that was built? But because snow's heavy, right? So they, instead of just making a giant snowball on the base, they formed it around a giant stump. And then some buffoon thought that he would run into their snowman and immediately got his, right? So you can see the tire tracks abruptly ended. And there's like a fender imprint on the bottom of the snowman. Snowman won, by the way. This guy taking a selfie with a cobra. Guys, with these super deadly cobra. Okay, and then this, this teen who thought they stole cocaine, but <laughs> snorted grandpa's ashes. <laughs> Humanity, and I think this is the last one. This guy has an emotional support alligator that he cuddles with that's buddies with his other alligator. They like have this like little pool inside the house. I'm like, that's just strange. So stupid people, right? By the way, I just got to tell you, if you enjoy laughing at stupid people, you should follow the TSA on Instagram because they are always posting the things stupid people try to take on an airplane, like duct taping birds to your legs and stuff to smuggle <laughs> thing. It's great. It's really great. So if you want to look at stupid people, that's great. Um, but so here's the thing. Ultimately, we're all kind of dumb, right? And the Bible has some stories of some pretty dumb people too. Um, and in this, this series that we're doing, a line of sinners pointing its way to Christ, right, as the savior of sinners, we see some real gems. And tonight's not an exception. Um, but we're also going to jump in a time machine real quick, because from where Nicholas left off last week, we're going to go forward about 500 years. Um, but let's just kind of like run through that style with the time machine, okay? So we have Jacob, he becomes Israel, and then he has lots of kids, specifically has 12 sons and one daughter. Her name was Dinah. She probably was really good at football. Um, then, like, there's this whole rivalry and tension, and, and Joseph, like, gets up, sold to slavery and goes to Egypt, but then he, like, is really good, and then he gets in a lot of trouble for something he didn't actually do, and so he's in prison, and then all of a sudden, like, from prison to, like, Pharaoh's right-hand man, and he's helping with them, preparing for famine, and then his brothers, and there's this cool story, and, like, they're in famine, and they come over to Egypt, and everything's working out good, and they camp out in Egypt for a really long time, and then Pharaoh's like, oh, there's too many of you, so the solution to too many of you is to have them in slavery, um, which, interesting point with that that we'll revisit a little bit later, but today is part of End It Movement, right, awareness for slavery, so if you've seen people with a red X on their hand, um, it's to bring 
Um, awareness to the fact that slavery still exists now. It's not something that was just then. Um, but then, like, out of that, we've got Moses. You're probably familiar with some of his stories, or at least some of the things surrounding him with, like, the plagues and Passover and let my people go. Okay, no. Let my people go. Okay, no. Let my people go. Fine, just get out of here. And then they cross, and, like, God parts the Red Sea and then drowns the Egyptians after the people are across. And then the people, like, Yay, God is faithful. And then they get to Mount Sinai and Moses is gone for a little bit. And they're like, what about God? Golden calf, woohoo!" And then God's like, no. And so they're in trouble and they're in the desert. And then they finally get to the promised land. And then they send these spies across over to investigate the promised land, right? And they come back and like, dude, it's awesome. Like, food looks amazing, but their people are huge. And so this is intimidating. And so they were more focused on the people than they were on God. And God's like, okay, then wander the desert for 40 years. And maybe you'll remember how faithful I am. And you'll be more worried about me than the big people there. So we get to the end of their wandering for 40 years. And then we're back where they were 40 years later. Um, And we're about to conquer the promised land. The land that they had been at before they went to Egypt to free or flee from famine, they're back here again. And this is where we find our story. This is where we find Joshua leading the people after the death of Moses, and he sends two spies in to scout the land, two instead of 12, and it's about 1406 BC. And this is when we read or we meet the person that we're going to talk about and read about um, tonight, and her name is Rahab. Um, So if you guys have your app or your Bible, um, go ahead and open. We are going to be in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. Now, I want to pause here for just a second. Why especially Jericho? Okay, so Jericho not only was one of the first cities when you cross over the Jordan River, right, but it had tremendous walls around the city. It was the greatest fortified city in Canaan. And so if Jericho fell, then the rest of Canaan stood zero chance. So if they conquer this one first, then the people are going to be completely like, yeah, just take the city, right? Or they're going to be less likely um, to think that they have a chance, okay? But also because it was the first one there. So it's a strong fortress. It's an important city with massive walls. So especially Jericho. And they went, and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Okay, I want to pause again for a second because some people try to sanitize the story, right? And say, Rahab wasn't really a prostitute. She was more like an innkeeper because that's where people would stay. Or she was a reformed prostitute. She was probably more like a madam. Or, well, maybe that was just a euphemism for something else. Okay, in our Bibles, there's some pretty gross stories, even about people who are super godly people. So I think if Rahab was an innkeeper, it would tell us she was an innkeeper, right? I believe Rahab was truly a prostitute. Um, let's continue on a little bit now that we've clarified that. So the prostitute whose name was Rahab and they lodged there. Oh, I also want to talk again about the guys. I don't think that they were there for some entertainment, okay? Because when we look at these guys, we see that they have integrity and character and they're focused on God and the things that he can do. So I really do think that they weren't there for the side entertainment, okay? They were truly just lodging there and God was using the situation, And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. Okay, so the king had no doubt that these two spies had come to her place. But the woman had taken two men and hidden them, and she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where they went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof, because it was like time to process that stuff. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So the first thing that I want you guys to see here in this text, we've got this kind of complicated character, right? She's a Canaanite woman. She's a prostitute. She's also a liar. 
Um, there's been a lot of um, discussion in commentaries about that and like, God used a liar, like, is he condoning lying? No, but it doesn't make an excuse for her lying, so like, what's going on? It's just a complicated scenario and situation, right? And if you were looking for, like, the poster child for, like, recruitment and rescue, it really probably wouldn't be Rahab, right? Like, if you're looking at somebody and going, like, yeah, let's find, like, the perfect, most ideal person, according to people's standards anyway, you probably would have just, like, glossed right past her and onto somebody else, But this is the person that God chose to use. And so the first thing that I want you guys to see in our text tonight is that God uses broken vessels. Like we said, Rahab was an unlikely candidate. She was a prostitute, a liar, a traitor, right? So she betrayed her country because she sided with these foreigners instead of with her countrymen. And she was a pagan, right? She was worshiping the gods of her land. There's this book that I'm studying with um, the ladies that live at the women's house, and it's called In His Image um, by Jen Wilkin, and I'm going to reference it a couple of times tonight. But there's a quote in particular that I want to share with you. And if you have the YouVersion app open to our notes tonight, it's in there as well. She says, today, the broken vase that she's talking about, this vase that she had bought at um, an antique store once, um, but her kids knocked it over, and it broke, and she attempted to fix it. It still sits on a bookshelf in my living room. And it still holds a form that declares its beauty and purpose. But its ability to do what it was created to do is now limited. And the closer you stand to it, the more evident the cracks. But I still love it, broken or not. We are stamped with his mark and bear his image, speaking about God. Even after the shattering catastrophe of Genesis 3, this is when sin came into the world, right? We still bear his image. We still hold value to him. Every human life. We're cracked vessels, designed to display beauty, but leaking at every fissure. God's will is that the cracks in the image we bear be repaired so that we represent him as we were created to do. I absolutely love that quote and that story that she has, but as I was talking with some of the girls, um, Hannah Hume pointed something out that I thought was really cool and I've become kind of obsessed with, but she started telling me about Kintsugi. Any of you know, besides Hannah and the girls that I've talked about it since then with, does anybody know what kintsugi is, just by show of hands? Cool. I'm really excited that only a few of you know. Um, Okay, so basically what happened is, and this is a form of Japanese pottery, right? So there was a shogun a long, long time ago, and he had this tea bowl that he really, really liked. And it fell, and it broke, and so he was so devastated that he shipped it off to China from Japan to have them fix it. But it came back, and it had these giant staples in the pottery, because that's how they fixed it back then. And it made this thing that he loved so hideous. And he's like, guys, this isn't acceptable. Fix my tea bowl, right? And so they came up with this idea called kintsugi, which I can't afford the real thing, right? Because like a cheap mug is like 150 bucks. Um, so I ordered a replica um, on Etsy. Someday maybe I'll get a real piece. But so what they do when they take this piece of broken pottery and they put it back together, in order to make it something that's beautiful and functional, they actually use gold to help put it together. And so this useless thing that was broken and of no function or purpose, all of a sudden not only is functional again, but it's more beautiful than it ever was before. In fact, where the flaws were is now where the best part is, right? And it makes it the most valuable part. The reason that they're so expensive is because that's gold. Now, this isn't. That's just paint. But (laughs) but on the real pieces, the reason that it's worth so much is because now it's held together with gold. And it becomes this masterpiece and this art. And it's all about the part that's holding it together. And see, I love in that that we see so much Christ, even in this style of Japanese pottery. Jeremiah 18, um, verses 3 through 6, it talks about this pottery that's broken, right? But how the potter is able to take this, this discarded, unworthy, broken thing, and he can rework it and shape it and use it still. See, the thing that becomes or that was the definition of brokenness, and it becomes the most beautiful part. And that's God's work in us. And I just love the truth in that. See, Rahab was a really broken vessel. And most people would have looked at her and said, not really usable. But she's the one that God desired to use. And as broken vessels, it's Jesus that makes us whole, that makes us holy, valuable, right, and restored. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. See, Jesus made what we could not. Even if we attempted to put the pieces back together, we're still just going to leak all over the place. And we can't fully function as we were created to do because sin, right? Because we're stupid, ignorant, sinful people. But God puts us together and makes, it, makes us function. And the more we walk in relationship with him, the more Christ is at work in us, the more we can function as he has created us to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So the first thing tonight is that God uses broken vessels. But let's read on in verses 8, and I'm sorry, it probably only through 11 is in there, but we're actually going through verse 14 for our second point. So before the men lay down, before they went to bed, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Ammonites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Okay, so we're going to pause for a second before we continue on. Who are Sion and Og? Now, I just want to encourage you, whenever you encounter things like this in Scripture, it's not something you should just gloss past, but it's an invitation to dig deeper, right? Because things aren't mentioned in Scripture for no purpose. There's a purpose and there's a reason. So they were Amorite kings, right, from a neighboring country. Their story is in Numbers 21, verses 21 through 35, if you want to go back and read it sometime. But King Sion... So the people are coming back, right, to Canaan to conquer. They come out of the wandering, and they tell him, like, hey, dude, our beef's not with you. Our promised land's over there. Like, we're not even going to drink your water. Just let us come through your land, and we'll just be about our business, and just let us go. And he's like, no. Okay. Then you and all your people will die, and we'll move on through anyway. So death, defeated, destruction, and then onward. Um, Og didn't learn the lesson from what happened with Sion. He's like, ah! So he like, gets his army and goes against them, and then they all die too. So these people that refused to do what was asked of them um, or came up against them got completely decimated, and then they moved on. So that's what Rahab's saying. Like, we heard what happened to those dudes, and we were all terrified Verse 11 goes on and says, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. And then this is my favorite part, guys. Listen to this. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And then she moves on. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. See, I want to pause for a second, too, because we have a tendency, I mean, let's be honest, I know I'm not the only judgy person. You guys are judgy, too, right? Like, we see something, and we're just like, really? You're going to drive like that? Or like that person's in class, like, dude, have some self-respect, right? But this is something that I've, I've been thinking about a lot. There's a couple of shows that I watch, and i um, just thinking about, like, the motive behind, right? And we often see the action, but we don't really know the person behind it, right? And how often is it that you're really annoyed with somebody until you have a decent conversation with them, and all of a sudden, like, you know who they are? And so those things that are so frustrating, you can look past because you see the person behind their ridiculous behavior, Right? See, previously, all we knew about Rahab was that she was this prostitute that was a traitor, but now we see that she also really cares about her family. See, we're more than our sin, right? We're still God's creation, created in his image, stamped with his mark. Rahab was more than a prostitute. She was a woman that heard of the things that God did and that wanted to rescue her family, and she went to some pretty extreme measures to do so hiding these guys in her house, lying to not just anybody, guys, her king, lying to her king in order to hopefully secure rescue, but without promise when she was doing it, okay? Hoping to secure rescue for her family. That's who she is behind just the label. 
So here's what the men say in verse 14. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So the second thing I really want you guys to see tonight is that God calls his creation. Man, it's one of my favorite things to talk about and to see in scripture is that God seeks to restore relationship with mankind. He wants to fix what he didn't break. Man, and he goes through all of the effort to do it. We just have to let him. And I think that's absolutely incredible. God wants restored relationship even with a broken vessel like Rahab, and he wanted to use her for his glory. Now, I also think this is interesting, right? Because ultimately, the spies' information didn't change anything. I mean, sure, they were excited that the people were terrified, but they still went after Jericho the way they had planned to before. And spoiler, it falls. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it doesn't really change anything. So I have to wonder, and some commentators ask this too, was the whole point of the spies' journey into the land not really to gather intel, but for God to rescue Rahab. So I mentioned that we would come back to this awareness of um, human trafficking and of slavery and that it still exists today and that it existed then. See, out of that whole city of people, only Rahab is the one that said, your God is the God of heaven and earth. She knew of what was done, but she also recognized and confessed who God was. She was someone who was not only in the sex trade, but was also like a slave to sin. But she recognized God and wanted a part of him somehow. We sang, the, I think it was the second song that you guys sang, and it was talking about walking around the walls. And I was like, oh, that's so fitting for Rahab. You know, I wonder if she actually walked the walls sometimes. I mean, literally, like... Maybe it was her gig. Um, but she was walking, and I wonder if she was thinking, like, man, is this all that there is? Is this all that there is for me? I wonder if, like the song said, she was yearning for change and wanting some change, but no idea how to get there. And then when she hears the stories of what happened, she's like, man, the gods that my people have been worshiping, they can't do those things. But a god like that? Man, that's someone worth serving. That's someone who can make things happen. That's someone who can change things, even for someone like me. She testified to the power of God. She confessed him as the God. But see, she didn't just stop with reverence or fear. She also sought rescue. So that's the thing. Sometimes we can have this revelation, and then we just kind of sit there. But she didn't just sit there. She sought rescue. She went, I don't know how the slaves exactly ended up in her house, but she was purposeful and intentional about it. Don't make any mistake. And I love that this is the story of Scripture from cover to cover. It's God's redemptive plan. But let's continue on for our third point and read Joshua chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. So after they tell her, like, okay, sure, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made to us. Swear, behold, then we come to the land. You shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then, if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed. <clears throat> but this last part. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. See, the third point tonight is God sees the scarlet cord. Rahab knew what she needed to do in order to have salvation, right? They told her, hang the cord, keep your oath. But she still had to actually do it, right? She was still in a position of needing to actually tie the cord and to actually not betray them. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. And see, fast forward to Jesus, God offers his son, 
with his blood on that cross. So you have the information, but what are you going to do with him? Now, we see in Joshua chapter 2, verse 21 through 24, they go back and they tell Joshua everything that happened. They um, come back and they, they, the Israelites come and there's this whole like crossing the Jordan on dry grounds. Um, there's a new generation of men and so there's the circumcision that happens as a mark of the covenant. They have their first Passover in Canaan. And then there's like this really weird story. You guys, Veggie tells people... The French peas keep walking. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so, like, when they're going to conquer the city, you'd think that they would have, like, these giant ramrods or something, or they'd have, like, these cool, like, rope ladders that they throw, and there's going to be this awesome, like, super cool battle. But God actually tells Joshua, no, like, you're just going to have the people silently, like, all the people silently, which is a feat in of itself, follow and walk around the entire city this one time, and, like, the priests are going to be blowing trumpets, like, the whole time, but it's, like, this super eerie thing, and I can only imagine, like, living in the city and, like, seeing all those people walking around and, like, the trumpets, and they're not saying anything, I'm like, this is really creepy, and it happens for six days, like, every single day it happens, and then on the seventh day, they're supposed to walk seven times around the city, right, and God's like, don't worry, I got this, just do what I'm telling you to, and so, like, the people are like, okay, one lap, whoa, no, they're still going, seven laps, which is a city. I don't know exactly how big it is or how long it took to walk around, but I would imagine that it wasn't like over in an hour, okay? It's taking some time for them to walk around. And then the people stand and they face the walls and God tells them to all yell. They're yelling at a wall, right? And then God demolishes it. It like, flat. And they take the city. I think that's pretty cool. The city falls, it's captured, it's destroyed. And then in Joshua chapter 6, verse 17, read this with me. We're going to back up a little bit into 16. Um, so Joshua says to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. And then Joshua, the leader of all the people, says, Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Joshua remembered her. The two spies remembered her. But ultimately, what I want you to see here is that God remembered her. Because really, who knocked down the wall? Not Joshua or his people. God knocked down the wall, right? So who's the one that left her part standing where she and her family were? It was God. God's the one who spared her and saved her. He's the one who saw the scarlet cord and said no and left that standing. But there's this quote that I heard at an ordination this past weekend that really stood out to me. A guy um, by the name of Michael DeFazio said it, and he said, when God looks at us, he sees the color red. And man, I think that's cool. Because when he looks at believers, he sees the blood of his son. He sees the color red, or I would say he sees the scarlet cord, right? And we're spared. The destruction that our sin deserves. So there's something that I kind of want to point out that, again, is something that I learned in reading this book by Jen Wilkin. Um, I'm going to share the first thing now and the second thing in just a minute. But she talks about this thing called positional holiness, right? Um, the other part that we'll talk about in a minute is practical holiness, but positional holiness. And I would say that positional holiness is faith, right? So that's where we have Rahab at this moment. This positional holiness. She had faith that, that God's people and that God would keep his word, right? She had faith that they were going to remember her and that her life and the life of her family was going to be spared. This is the rescue and the restoration. It was something that was done by another. And for Rahab here, it was her physical life being promised by the spies, spared by Joshua, ultimately by God. But see, for us, it's the redemptive work of Jesus at the cross and our eternal life being spared. But then we find our fourth and final point tonight in Joshua chapter 6, verses 22 through 25. But the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. So they're assimilating them into their people, right? They went, they got them, and they brought them out. 
Now, Rahab and her family, they left their destroyed city, and they went with the Israelites. And this is something that's pretty big that I want you guys to see here, because you may think, well, duh, I mean, the city was destroyed. What was left for her? But she did more than that, because if you look down and you see much later in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, she married a dude named Salmon, which, please don't name your kids that. Like, it gets confusing with the fish. Um, But she married a dude named Salmon, okay? And he was, like, almost like this prince of Judah. Like, he was the one that was, like, in charge of, like, these people. And she ended up being in the lineage of Christ, She left the place of death and brokenness and destruction where nothing was there for her, but she could have chosen to stay like, oh, I have work to do here, like build life from the rubble or something like that. But she's like, I want nothing left to do with the life of death. And I'm going to follow God into the unknown, which is the same thing that Abraham did. It's the same thing that Jacob did, following God into the unknown because he is trustworthy, even if you don't know exactly where he's taking you. Her faith led her to continued action, which is when I want to talk to you about the practical holiness, right? We mentioned the positional holiness, so this is the faith. Practical holiness, this is the obedience. This is the sanctification process. She took her spared life and she gave it to the God who spared her life with a faith, with a life of faith and obedience, This is the obedience. This is the action. This is the what now. Now, this is something, maybe you guys know it, but I didn't until I was reading this book this week by Jen. Um, I did not know that sanctify is the verb, but holy is the noun that comes from the word sanctify. So when God's saying, like, I am holy, I want you to be holy, this is the faith, this is the, I did all of this, right? I have made you in right standing with me. But then when he says that he wants us to walk in obedience and to be sanctified, he's saying, so now continue that holiness, right? Continue to let me fix these cracks and make you a usable vessel, right? This is the sanctification process, Interestingly, Rahab is mentioned also in the book Hebrews and James. Now, these are books that are often, we talk a lot about how like this one's all about faith and this one's all about works and what about the tension between the two? And I really think that they're two sides of the same coin. Hebrews 11.31 says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient by faith. Then James 2.25 says, In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different position or direction? Rahab was a woman, yes, she was a prostitute, but she was also a woman that was known for her faith, her positional holiness, and for her obedience her practical holiness. And I want to tell you guys tonight, God never calls us to a lethargic, lazy, or apathetic faith. I want you to hear that again. God never calls us to a lethargic, lazy, or apathetic faith. What does that mean? Your choices matter, guys. Your decisions matter. How you live your life matters. Sometimes we think that these decisions that we make don't affect anybody but ourselves. Guys, it matters, right? If you want to be a vessel that God's using, your choices matter because that's how he uses us. Rahab may have been one of the worst, but an encounter with God changed everything, and our faith should lead us to continued action. So as I close tonight and the worship team comes back up and we have some time just to kind of reflect on the things that that God did in this story, I want to kind of reiterate these things to you because I want you to have no doubt that all of you are his creation. And he is calling you into restored relationship with him. And not just each of you, but also the obnoxious classmate, the professor that you really can't stand, the frustrating family member that you're just like, oh, not again. Or that rude driver, okay? If I've talked to you more than five minutes, you know I have problems with drivers and thank God I have and I love my church decal in my car because it really holds me accountable um, for my actions when I drive. Um, But God calls the people that I run into, not literally run into, but the people that are really rude and ridiculous at the four-way stop on 12th Street by the train tracks, okay? Because you know that those people can't drive, right? (laughs) God loves them too and also wants restored relationship with them. And I have to remind myself of that and that the way that I interact with them and my choices and how I respond to their stupidity 
matters, right? Because if they see me getting super hostile in my car, rightly so, because they were wrong. But then later I'm trying to tell them about Jesus or that I'm married to a minister or I go to church or I work with CCF, they're not going to care. God uses broken vessels. I still get a little angry in the car sometimes, but he'll still use me, right? Even the most broken of you, even the ones that feel not good enough, because you're not good enough. No one is. We can't function without him, right? We can't function without Christ. And if you don't really know what to do with that, and when I say that, I want you to come talk to us sometime. Because talking about Jesus is our absolute favorite thing to do. The last two things I want to remind you, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, I want to remind you that when God looks at you, he sees his son, right? The scarlet cord. Jesus is the thing that is most beautiful about you. Not all the ways that he's disappointed in you. See, sometimes that's how we want to define ourselves, right? But it's Christ at work in you right? It's who God says you are. It's his son that defines you. And my very final thing that I want to leave you with is his child, he calls you to more. Like I said, he doesn't want you to be apathetic, lazy, or lethargic. God wants more obedience from you. God wants more faithfulness from you. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, um, God, I'm so thankful that you use broken vessels and that it's not about our ability, it's not about our qualifications, um, but that you do it all. God, I thank you that you give us this example of Rahab, a woman who made some pretty bad choices and decisions, um, but that ultimately she recognized you and she wanted a part of what it is that you are doing. Um, So Father, I ask that you would help us to submit to that. Um, And God, I ask that if there are people here tonight that, that don't know what that looks like, Um, that you would give them the courage to seek that out because, God, you're worth seeking. Um, God, I thank you for your faithfulness, and I thank you for your goodness. And it's in the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.